All right, and I'd like to pass it on to Mark Mather from the Population uh, Reference Bureau. Thanks, Polani. Hi, everybody. This is Mark Mather with PRB. Thanks for joining us today for this webinar on communicating about data effectively. This is part of a series of webinars that is being funded by the Casey Foundation. We selected this topic and the other topics for this series of webinars based on feedback from you all uh, based on topics that you said would be of interest. So I'm, I'm pleased today to introduce our two speakers. Both are my colleagues here at PRB. Uh, Beth Jarras, who's a senior research associate in our U.S. Programs Department, is going to speak first, and then she's going to turn it over to Jessica Wooden, who is a digital designer in our communications department. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Beth. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, we're going to be talking about communicating about data effectively, and in particular, we're going to focus on um, data visualization and infographics. Now, why do we want to do data visualization and infographics? Um, in part, it's to take advantage of what's known as pre-attentive processing. Um, if I asked you to count the number of blue dots within the gray square on the screen here, you would have to spend some time, maybe you know, put your finger up to the screen and count them one by one. Um, but if I asked you to count the number of red dots um, in this second square that's shown up, it's really simple that there's only one. Um, the color makes it really stand out, uh, and we're taking advantage of pre-attentive processing. You don't even need to think about how many red dots, you just know the answer. Um, perhaps a more um, illustrative example of this is if we look at um, the next slide, how many Zs do you see in this list of letters that's on the screen? Clearly, you would have to go um, letter by letter uh, through each of the lines, and you may or may not come up with the right number. But if we use a data visualization technique looking at hue, where we gray out um, the information that's not important, it's really clear that there are five Zs within that chunk of text. Um, so um, that's sort of what I want you to keep in the back of your mind for thinking about data visualization is one of the reasons we do this is to take advantage of that pre-attentive processing thing that our brains do. So our goals today um, are to talk about what data visualizations and infographics are, uh, just to make sure that we have common terminology. Um, and then we'll talk about what works and what does not work. We'll actually go through some very practical examples of you know, if you had data and were trying to tell a particular story, what type of visualization would you use? And then we'll talk about how to craft data visualizations in terms of workflow um, and some design principles. So let's get started with what is data visualization. Um, lots of people have lots of different definitions, so what you're going to get here is our take on it. Um, and what you see on the screen are four images. Um, and uh, in just a moment, you'll see a poll, an audience poll, where you'll get to decide which of these four images do you think is a data visualization. Um, and I suspect we will have more than one answer, but the, the options are going to be that it's a, only the color wheel in the bottom right-hand corner is a data visualization. B, the color wheel and the color bars, um, so the bottom right and the top left are data visualizations. C, the color wheel and the map, so the bottom two images are, color, are data visualizations. Or, or D, all of the above, all four of these are data visualizations. So of those options, which one do you think is a data visualization? You can go ahead and answer the question. And I'll give it just a moment while people are, have a chance to record their answers. In the meeting. They'll have a few answers coming in. Um, and I think that all of those show data, but the way that I would have answered this question may be different than the way that you answered it. Um, and so let's take a look at why I may have answered it differently. Um, so data visualization and infographics are two terms that are often used interchangeably, uh, but I see them and PRB sees them as two slightly distinct things. Data visualization is a non-text-based representation of data that enhances understanding of the data. And an infographic um, may include elements of data visualization, but it combines data, text, and visual imagery into a comprehensive narrative. 
Um, so infographics tend to be more text heavy, tend to be more narrative focused, and data visualization tends to be more, more strictly just about the data. So let's look at a couple of examples. Um, clearly, the, um, the wheel is an example of a data visualization. There's a lot going on here. We have colors representing five different dimensions of the, um, the kids count index. And um, the, the sections of the wheel representing individual states grouped by geographic part of the United States. And then the hue of the color from paler to darker or to brighter represents uh, a state's ranking in a, in a given category. So paler colors represent ranking lower or not doing as well, and the brighter colors represent higher or doing really well. And so we have a ton of information behind this fairly intuitive graphic um, that shows us that uh, states that are ranked lower tend to be on And states that are ranked higher um, tend to be concentrated in the Northeast and Midwest, which we see in the right-hand side and toward the top of the chart, because uh, you see those bright colors pop there. So there's a lot of information um, condensed into a simple, and I mean simple from a, an intuitive perspective, not simple, the design is simple perspective here. Um, but this clearly is a well-crafted data visualization. And, um, but data visualizations don't have to be complicated. Something as simple as a well-designed bar chart, line chart, or a color-coded map can be considered data visualizations. We don't have to make them complicated. Um, that said, if you have information that's complicated and you need a more complex tool, there's also a huge diversity of more complicated um, data visualization types available to you. I don't know if any of you have seen the um, migration flows cord chart that was going around on social media over the last few months, but it's a really beautifully designed visualization that shows flows of people from one country to another where the colors represent world regions and the size of the cord, the size of the line around the circle um, represents uh, the, um, the volume of people moving. So data visualizations can be, and, and that one's interactive, data visualizations can be very complicated or can be very simple. Um, and infographics, as I mentioned, tend to be more narrative. Um, so there is data, tends, uh, an infographic tends to pull out highlights of a larger report or a, a larger um, uh, sort of policy issue um, with data spotlighted. Uh, but and, th and there may be da uh, data visualization, like you see the pie chart in the bottom left of this infographic. There may be data visualizations embedded with an infographic, but an infographic has more text and is more of a narrative basis. And so if we come back to the four, data, the, the four images that we saw earlier, I've already answered for sure, um, everyone was right in thinking that the, um, the color wheel is definitely a data visualization. I would also say that the map was a data visualization. It's showing the proportion of children in poverty by state in the U.S. Um, and so that one definitely qualifies as data visualization. The top left, um, this one, given the, the lack of context here, I'm actually going to say is not. Um, so clearly we're interpreting this to be a bar chart, but without any data or labels on here, this could just as easily be a Mondrian style modern art painting. Um, for this. For those rect colored rectangles to qualify as a data visualization, we would need an axis or some data labels um, to illustrate what it is that those colored rectangles are trying to get us to see. So that one is on its way to being a data visualization, but we'd need to take a few additional steps to get it there. And the top right, the thumb icon with the 58%, again, we're lacking a little bit of context. We don't know what it's 58% of, um, but I could see that appearing on an infographic. Somewhere. Um, with, you know, the thumbs up gives us some indication that 58% is a good thing, um, but we would, we would want to see additional context. So I'm saying that one's an infographic, not data visualization. Um, but again, the, the distinction here can be a little bit individual. So however you answered the question, you were on the right track. So why do we use data visualizations? I started out at the beginning talking about pre-attentive processing and the fact that um, those data visualizations help us speed up an audience's um, understanding of data, and that's an important piece. Attention spans have fallen uh, from 12 seconds in 2000 to 8 seconds in 2015, at least according to a study conducted by Microsoft in 2015. 
Um, and as you saw with those pre-attentive processing examples, data visualization allows quicker understanding of a data set and quicker processing of the information. So speed is really one of the key reasons why we use data viz. In addition to speed, comprehension is also an important reason for using data visualization. Um, what you see here is the percentage, and this is uh, some of the examples we'll be using today are from um, KC products, and some of them are um, fictitious examples, and some are sourced from other places. Um, but this one is from the Race for Results report, and this is the percent of high school students not graduating on time in 2014 and 2015. Um, and this is a very nice data visualization for a couple of reasons. You have uh, categories of the population easy, clearly identified, a national average that serves as a reference point um, that shows us who, which groups are, are graduating at rates lower or finishing on time at rates lower than the national average, um, and which ones are doing better than the national average. And so it's easy to comprehend the information that there are three population subgroups who are struggling to graduate on time relative to the national average. So a lot of information condensed and easy to, to understand. Another reason to use data visualization is visual impact. Um, so as Jessica and I were putting together examples for this workshop, um, one of the ones that I, I thought of that came to mind for an example of visual impact is an infographic or a visualization that I saw actually almost seven years ago now. It was the, the beginning of 2011 on the mortality rate um, due to conflict in Iraq for, since 2001. And as you can see, there's a lot of data here, but the designer also used color and used style to create an image that's really visually impactful and, and stays with you. Um, it's really clear to see that there are increases in mortality given certain years. Um, and this is one of those images that sticks with you, which is also important for retention. So the visualizations help the, your audience retain the information. Um, if I put up another quiz here about which one of these four images have you not seen before and which ones have you seen before, um, I am certain that you could all identify the fact that the one you haven't seen is the smiley face and the ones you have seen are the other three. Um, so data visualizations help with speed, they help with comprehension, they help with visual impact, and with retaining information. Um, and <coughs> visualizations do some work. They persuade, they explain, they explore. Beauty is desirable, but I'm not excited by pretty charts that are also pretty useless. Now this is a quote um, from a data science expert, but I would say that I thoroughly agree with this. You want to have data visualizations that are aesthetically appealing, but if that's all they are, then they're not doing your work for you. You want to make sure that you have a data visualization that has explained something to your audience that they may not have gotten from just reading the data in a table or from reading a report. So let's talk about how do you get to that point. How do we plan our data visualizations so that they can help us explain, they can help us explore, they can help us inform? First, just like any other um, just like any other presentation that you would do, whether you're writing a report or putting together a PowerPoint, you want to ask yourself what question am I trying to answer or message am I trying to convey? Uh, what's the best and most accurate way to represent this information? Um, and what, who is my audience? And we'll spend some time actually going through examples of if your message is you want to talk about current conditions, if your message is you want to talk about trend over time, what tool would you use? Um, so Clearly, in a PowerPoint presentation kind of a format, a, a large table of data is not going to work. This sort of format works great in a printed report, is a fabulous reference for people, um, but you don't generally want to have complicated tables um, and try to call that data viz because the audience can't read through them that quickly. That said, um, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about graphics and chart types, but sometimes a table is actually the best way to present your information. So if what you're talking about is current conditions for one particular geographic area or one particular topic um, at a given point in time, don't rule out a table as being a way to illustrate or to present your data. So in this case, we have fictitious county X and 40% of children in our county X were in deep poverty in 2016. Um, this, given that that's the message, it, in this context, a table may be the best way to get that point across. 
Um, that said, there will be a couple of other ways that I use this fictitious example and show you other ways to illustrate this concept. Um, so, but I just wanted to make sure that we don't give tables short shrift just because um, big tables don't work. Sometimes small ones do. Um, if we're going to show change over time, so again, looking at our county X, um, if we wanted to talk instead of, uh, instead of talking about what's going on in county X today, we want to talk about what's happened in county X over time, we want to use a line chart. Um, and here we can really clearly see that the poverty rate in county X has risen pretty dramatically since 2000. Um, when we're using line charts, they can be good for showing trends, certainly great for showing trends for one area or for one topic or population subgroup. You can, you can often use them for two or three of those groups. When you, uh, and, and sometimes if there's enough distinction between categories and enough space between lines, four or five lines on a chart can still be legible. Uh, you don't want to show six or more categories on a line chart ever because when we start to show too many categories on a line chart, we end up with spaghetti charts um, where even with some labeling that shows county X um, up here in the top right-hand corner, we, you know, we see that that's, the X is still there, but it's really hard to trace that line back um, and see any sort of trend in what's going on with county X or really any trend in any of the, the example counties that we have here. So if you have more than five categories, it's probably time to look at a different kind of a tool. Um, so if we're comparing across multiple groups, a bar chart might be the best option. Um, again, we have um, a kids count example here, the child poverty rate uh, by race and ethnicity. Um, and again, we have the national average up at the top and a nice divider line that, that sort of shows where the national average is relative to the other groups. It's really clear to see which groups are doing better than and which groups are doing not as well as the national average. Um, and the comparison is really clear. Compare that with um, what was happening here on the, um, the spaghetti chart. You can't tell what's going on so well here. It's really obvious the comparison across the categories. So if you have multiple categories, a bar chart may be the way to go. And bar charts can also re be really great for multiple dimensions. Um, when in this chart you see that we have two different kinds of test scores. We have proficient in reading on the left and in math on the right, fourth graders on the left and eighth graders on the right. And then we have two categories of, of population um, where the children in immigrant families are in dark orange and children in US born families is uh, the white bar with the orange outline. And it's really clear to see that in terms of um, both reading proficiency and math proficiency, there's a big gap between children born in immigrant families and children born in U.S. Um, in U.S. born families. And so uh, you can do multiple dimensions in bar charts quite nicely and quite clearly. So this complicated um, multiple dimension comparison here um, really designed nicely with bar charts. A couple of things that you may have noticed about the examples we've shown so far is that um, a good visualization should have a, what we call a telegraphic title. Essentially, it's put your key message right up top. Um, you also want to make sure you include source notes. Um, in the era of social media, uh, a data visualization that you intend to use at a moment in time uh, may often take on a life of its own. Someone may do a screen capture from your website, may take a picture of your slide at a presentation and share it on social media. So both for credibility and to make sure you get credit for your work, you want to make sure that you include source notes um, that, are, that, that will go, travel along with the visualization wherever it goes. And you also want to make sure that your labeling is, is very clear. Um, and Jessica and I will both talk about that in more detail. Um, so moving on, and now you can see I have my telegraphic title showing the economic index. Um, by state shows Midwest states ranked highest, um, and my source note down at the bottom, the Kids Count Data Book 2017. Um, if what you're showing is regional patterns, whether it's patterns across states in the United States or counties within your state or across um, zip codes or census tracts within a metro area in your state, a map is often a very um, compelling way to show um, those regional differences. And so if your message is about regional differences, parts of your state or parts of the nation doing better than others, a map is an excellent uh, visualization tool to use for that. 
Um, if you're showing percent of total, so you want to talk about how a group is doing relative to the, the total population, um, you may want to use a pie chart. Now, in, you, you may have in other data visualization presentations heard that you should never, ever, ever use a pie chart. Um, and I take the approach that it's sort of like grammar rules. You have to learn the rules in order to figure out when to break them. Um, and so I am not quite as strict in my dismissal of pie charts as some other experts may be, um, because there are some times when they can work. So for example, we have two categories, and it's very clear that most children on this pie chart are in poverty. You know, that bright red Pac-Man part of the chart um, really jumps off the page at you, and you can see that three out of four children are in poverty. Uh, that said, there are other ways of showing this information. Um, and so we could use icons, for example. We could do three out of four children using child icons and highlight three of them in red to show that three out of four children in County X are in poverty. So you don't have to use a pie chart. Um, it may be useful. Um, another example of a pie chart I really love for is the, the federal budget. What proportion of the federal budget goes to a couple of different big categories? It's very effective at showing um, defense spending, Social Security, and Medicaid, and the share that they take up of federal spending. So there are times when they can work. That said, one thing you never want to do is compare pie charts. If you're trying to show two different geographies or someplace at two different points in time, what the eye can't do is distinguish the size of the slices across two, across two different pies. So while this one is labeled, if I took the labels away and asked you to tell me which slice is bigger, this, um, the, the dark red um, in deep poverty on the left-hand chart or the dark red in deep poverty on the right, um, it's really hard for your eye to tell which one is bigger. You might guess that the left one is bigger, but you wouldn't know by how much without those labels on there. Um, so you may want to use a pie chart if you're showing one you know, element in time and things add up, sum up to 100%. But in general, if you're trying to make a comparison, a better option is a stacked bar chart. Here, it's really obvious that the line on the, for 2015 is higher. Um, and you, you know, we have that little guideline that's showing the, the level of growth in deep poverty. Um, it's just a much cleaner way of representing that data. Um, and last but certainly not least, if what you're doing is building an infographic, you may, or I'm sorry, what you're doing is building a narrative, what you may want to use is an infographic. Um, so we've talked about tables, we've talked about lots of different data visualization uh, chart types and when you would use them. And sometimes your message is more complicated and what you're trying to do is tell a story and in that case an infographic becomes a tool that you would want to use. Um, a couple of other points to keep in mind. A good data visualization should be accurate and not misrepresent your data, should be easy to understand, should relate to your audience, and should only show what's necessary. And Jessica will go through a couple of examples of when to add and when to remove elements um, and figuring out that balance between what stays in and what goes. Um, a couple of common mistakes with data accuracy is oversimplifying um, or, or uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, oversimplifying data or labels. Um, your chart elements uh, being sized by diameter instead of area. Having inaccurate data, so you always want to make sure that as you're designing your data visualization, for example, that the, the labels and the sizes match the original data. Um, you want to make sure that your formatting tells your message, it doesn't run counter to your message. So for example, um, if something is getting better, you don't want it to become a brighter and darker red over time because um, that tends to signal something being worse. Um, and you also don't want to truncate the y-axis um, in your data visualization. And I'll look at some examples of each of these ways that data viz can go wrong. So if I ask you what's wrong here um, with this chart of stacks of money and some income ranges and some percentages above them, there are lots of things wrong. The first one is there's not enough context. The title income above this chart doesn't give us anywhere near enough information to understand what these percentages and stacks of money are supposed to represent. Now, I did this one intentionally. Part of a larger infographic on Facebook usage among key demographic subgroups. But even here, um, I would still say that there's some additional, um, there are some additional problems with the data visualization. So the percentages are, are the information that the designer is really trying to get across. They're trying to show that 77% of 
of um, people with incomes under $30,000 a year use Facebook, and 69% of, of users or of people with incomes 30 to $50,000 use Facebook. But the stacks are running counter to what those percentages are. Um, so if I were to redesign this, I would actually take the money stacks away because we're used to reading different categories as being in sequence. Um, I would put the lowest income on the left, the f highest income on the right, and, and then have the bar size proportional to the Facebook share, or the Facebook user share. Um, and the same thing happens again with education, that we're supposed to understand that one book represents high school or less and three books represents college graduates. Um, that, those icons aren't adding information, they're actually sort of confusing the message. So a couple of ways to clean this one up. Um, another one in terms of what's wrong here, there's, before we talk about what's wrong here, a couple things are right actually. Um, Jessica will talk more, more about selecting color, but one of the things I like about this chart is the fact that it, the colors used align with what we would think. So blue represents cold, that orangish red represents hot, and gray is people who don't have a preference for one or the other. Um, so that part of this viz works. The piece that doesn't work for me is that it's really difficult for the eye to tell um, how much bigger the blue section is than the orange, in, in particular because there's this big gap um, here where there's like, a, there's like a, an empty space um, in the chart. So it, it's hard for the eye to see with, if this um, labeling section was totally gone, it's hard for the eye to see where they're supposed to be um, to compare those two groups. So I would use a, a regular old stacked bar chart. It might not be as visually appealing, but it does a better job of telling the story in this data. Another thing we want to make sure we don't do is, is truncate the axis. What you see here is the total fertility rate of U.S. women um, from 1990 to the present. And you can see what looks to be a really dramatic drop in, in the total fertility rate starting at about 2008 when the recession started. Um, but if you pay careful attention, you'll see on the left-hand side that the axis starts at 1.8 rather than starting at zero. So if what we do is start at zero instead, you tell, it tells a much different story. Yes, the total fertility rate has fallen, but clearly the drop is not as dramatic as that prior chart showed. Um, so you want to be really careful about starting your axis at zero unless, again, rules you want to know, you know so that you know when to break them. Um, in very, very unique circumstances, there may be a, a compelling reason to start an axis at a different value, but generally speaking, you want to start at zero. So um, one of the other things you want to be thinking about as you're building your data visualization is who is your audience? Where are they from? Um, how are they viewing the information? What's their level of expertise? Are they skeptical and why should they care? Um, and so if we look at the percent of children in poverty for 2016 for all states in the United States, clearly this chart doesn't work. Um, there are so many states on here that we don't even have labels for all of them because the labels don't fit. This chart shows too much um, and does not work as a data visualization. If um, what I'm doing is presenting to a community group in Massachusetts and I want to talk about um, the, the the sort of fairly low rate of child poverty in Massachusetts relative to other states nearby, what I might want to do is talk about, sorry, I apologize, my slides keep going two at a time. Um, I might want to, to select out just a handful of states. So I've picked all of the New England states as context because people in the room in Massachusetts are going to understand um, those neighboring states and they're a good point of reference. I've highlighted Massachusetts to make sure that it jumps off the page and that that's where the conversation is going to stay. Um, and then added a title that tells the story of one in ten children in Massachusetts lives in poverty. Um, and so depending on the audience, I would pull out and tailor the chart in different ways, but that's the kind of thinking you want to be doing. You don't want to put all of the data out there just because you have it. You want to think about who's the audience and who's on the receiving end and how can you pull out pieces selectively for your data visualization that will help you um, engage with the audience and inform the audience. So in summary, data visualization can um, improve message speed, comprehension, appeal, and retention. You want to identify your story and then select the display type that you're going to use, and we went through some examples. You want to make sure you don't misrepresent the data uh, with chart elements or viz elements that, that disproportionately size 
pieces relative to each other or um, scale is off. And you want to make sure you're thinking about the audience when you're designing your data visualization. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica to give you her insights about design. Thank you, Beth. Now we're going to go over some concrete ways to improve your data visualizations through design. The first rule is to really think about all the design elements that appear in your graphic, each line, word, or shape. One well-known principle in data viz design is the idea of the data ink ratio, meaning you should try to communicate the essential data with the minimum amount of design elements on screen. You should always ask yourself if each element is necessary. If it's not doing anything to help the understanding of your graphic, then you can delete it. But if you think something is unclear and would be aided by another line or word, you can go ahead and add it. And if you're not sure, you can always ask someone for a second opinion. On the left, we have a typical bar graph where we have an x-axis with labels and a legend. The title and the legend both read total metals. The vertical lines help you line up the bars to the correct number beneath. But is all of this necessary? Also, the title is not very helpful. The user doesn't know what they received medals for. On the right, the title was edited to be more specific. It reads top 10 countries by total medal count, Sochi Winter Olympics 2014. We've removed the x-axis numbers and put them directly in the bars themselves, so no need for vertical lines either. We've still labeled the x-axis to make it very clear that those numbers in the bars are for metals. Visually, the example on the right is cleaner and requires less work to determine the numbers for each country. Here's another before and after where we've removed some elements because they weren't helping and also added something in. These graphs show the chair of the share of children in Midwestern states who live in poverty and in deep poverty. The black lines that bordered each bar were removed, and we removed the percentage symbols on the bottom axis so it would be easier to read. The gray vertical lines were added in this case. Unlike the previous slide, we didn't want to label each bar because there were so many states and it would have cluttered the graph. Plus, here we are more interested in a general sense of which states have lower or higher rates of opposition to the practice versus knowing what the ex exact percent is. This is a lot of states to include on a PowerPoint slide. It's probably hard for you to read the state names and see the ones you're interested in. So if this is a data viz that will be a PowerPoint slide, you would probably want to reduce states or find a way, such as through color, to draw the audience's attention to the one or two states you are highlighting. Now for some standard rules on typography. We want to use sans serif fonts as much as possible. These are the ones that don't have extra extensions on the ends of letters. This keeps text clean and simple and makes it a lot easier to read. Some easy ways to create emphasis are to use all caps or make words bold, italicized, or bigger. We don't want to go overboard with these options, so think about which words really need the emphasis and try not to do too many for one graphic. Always keep your fonts consistent and only use one to two different fonts throughout any presentation or graphic. When you see a presentation with a lot of different fonts in it, it starts to look very amateur and is distracting. Also, don't forget to utilize title text. Sometimes you may want it to be very direct about what the data is showing, but depending on your audience, you may alter the title to make the central message clearer. In this example, we have a two-part title. There's a top-line title that is the takeaway message. It reads, women need additional education to match men's earnings. Then right above the data viz is a more technical title that reads median earnings among men and women ages 25 and older by education level 2015. You might see something more like the top line title in a newspaper. The bottom one would be for more technical audiences. In this case, it was for a bulletin that could potentially be used by multiple audiences. So here's an example that we often come across. It's before and after pie charts, as Beth showed earlier, when you're supposed to see how each segment changed over time. However, with pie charts, it can be difficult to compare segment sizes. When you have changes over time among different categories, some better options could be bar charts or an area chart. Another option could be to call out a data point using just text. You may want to do this if there's really nothing else interesting going on in those graphs or this is all your audience really cares about. Here we've made the 110% text bigger and green to highlight the positive aspect. 
speaking of green, now we're going to talk about color. Most people don't spend much time choosing the colors for their PowerPoint presentations. Color is something we often take for granted, but it is very important for data viz because it is a tool for communication. Looking at these two graphics, it is much easier to see the boundary between the blue and red sides on the left than it is between the circles and squares on the right. Our brains are designed to process color much more quickly than shapes or text. Professional designers can spend hours thinking about which exact colors they want to use, making sure they harmonize well and reflect the look they want to achieve. Here are some basic color tips for you. Darker or brighter colors will usually read as more, so you generally want higher numbers or quantities to be associated with stronger colors. Gray is often overlooked as a color choice, but it's very useful when you need to show something but don't want it to take as much attention. I use gray in almost everything I design. Also, utilize white space. Make sure things aren't crowded together. White space can help create some cushion between things so it doesn't look messy and cramped. Every color used must have a reason for being there and should be distinct. Similar to our conserve your ink approach, we want colors to also be used strategically. Choose an appropriate color palette and keep them consistent. If you want to make your Excel charts look better, just don't use the default color scheme. We also don't want colors to be too distracting. Once you've figured out a color scheme, keep them the same across your presentation. If you're not sure where to start when creating a color palette, there are plenty of tools out there to help you, such as Color Brewer, Colors, or Adobe Color. You can start with a specific color and they'll help you build your color, your palette based on that color, or you can start from scratch and they'll create a palette for you. Keep in mind that color has meaning. The higher the contrast between objects, the more different they are perceived. In this example, you can see how the red really stands out among the other colors. This could be one way to draw attention to a specific data point, but also remember that because colors have meaning, you must be careful which colors are linked to certain categories. Red can be perceived as something negative. This is a map on child poverty rates by state. The map is color-coded by a very wide range of colors. The problem is that the green is much stronger in hue than the other colors, so it reads as more. Without reading the legend, you may think that the Midwest and Northeast have the highest rates of child poverty. And blue tends to read as cool, so you might think the southern states have low rates. But according to the legend, blue indicates the highest rate and green is the middle rate. This redesigned map sticks with the same orange color family and makes the darkest color indicate the highest rate of prevalence. It's easier to tell looking at this map that child poverty rates are higher in the South than in the Midwest. Here you can see how a stronger color draws your eye to the row for India in the chart on the right. This combined with the text changes, the italics and the extra line down at the bottom, makes it really clear what you are trying to emphasize. This state of is relies on color to tell the story. It shows votes across party lines in the U.S. House of Representatives. In the 1970s, shown in the top row, the two groups had more crossover in their voting patterns. In later years, they have been steadily voting more and more within party lines, creating a separation between the two parties. This is another example where color really makes the data viz. This shows the effectiveness of the measles vaccine. States are listed in each row, and each column is a year in time. We have a range of numbers corresponding to shades from light blue to red, representing the number of measles cases. Red is used to indicate the highest number of measles cases, which is around 4,000 in one year. The big black line going up the middle indicates the point when the measles vaccine was introduced. Notice how the colors quickly disappear across the states and turn into this light blue shade, which is close to zero cases. Now we're going to talk about icons. Icons are symbolic images that can add some visual flair to an otherwise text-heavy or number-heavy graphic. You can use them to depict percentages, like these figures here in the top left. This would represent 1 in 10. Sometimes they are used when you may not necessarily have a data point to show, but you have a fact or bit of information that can use some visual cue on what it's about, as seen in the example in the top right. You find them a lot in infographics. At the bottom, we are showing how icons may or may not help in the design of a map. Can you tell which map is showing libraries and hospitals? Probably not. 
So if you choose to use icons, make sure people can instantly tell what it is you are referring to. A good resource for icons such as these is the nounproject.com. You can download free icons as long as you give credit to the designer, or you can purchase a pro membership for around $40 a year. This is perhaps an unusual way of presenting data visually, but it can be effective. You can lay a graph over a relevant photograph to add visual interest. On the right, they're using different sized balls to show how many internet users there are in different parts of the world. Or in the bottom left example, they manipulated the photo to be the actual data viz. This is a pie chart about healthcare made with a petri dish. For those of you who want to do something more advanced, perhaps for a website, consider the power of interactive data visualizations. When you add in motion and clicks by the user, you can open up entirely new ways of presenting data. To produce something like this example, you would need to reach out to a developer to code this for you. This is a multi-part data viz that shows the data associated with climate change. With the interactive element, the user can investigate each data point separately, creating a much richer and more educational experience. There is a website called Infogram that can build simple interactive graphics. You copy and paste the code it gives you and then embed it on your website, similar to how you would embed a YouTube video. So now we're going to vote on how you would improve this data visualization. I'm going to leave this slide up for a few seconds so you can see the chart and then the options there on the right, and then I'll switch over to the voting tool. The options are A, move the y-axis to the left side of the bars, B, add a title, C, remove the 3D effect, or D, all of the above. Okay, so the answer here, which most of you got, is D, all of the above. So we don't recommend using three dimensions in your data visualizations unless there's some very specific need or reason for it. It's too difficult to see what's actually going on when the bars are all angled differently. In our improved example, we've also added a title and moved the scale to the left side where it is most commonly expected to be seen. We've left the colors here, but you can consider only using one color. A good reason to leave the different colors in is if you have color-coded the categories throughout your presentation or publication so people can associate a certain color with a specific category consistently. So now we're going to present some tools and workflow suggestions on how to put together a data viz. You all know about Excel and PowerPoint, but here are some alternative programs you may consider using. They all have free versions or trial versions for you to test them out. Infogram is an easy to use site that has a variety of visualizations to choose from. As I mentioned earlier, it also has the capability of adding interactivity to your visuals, so you can embed them in a website and have people click on them to change the visual. PictoChart is good for infographics, if that's the, de the design direction you want to go in. Easily can do data viz or infographics and has many templates to choose from. Visage is a site that incorporates photography into your data viz. CartoDB is an online mapping tool. Movely is a tool that helps you quickly create animations for motion charts. And Tableau, Adobe Illustrator, and D3JS are popular tools for advanced data viz producers. As a designer, Illustrator is my favorite because it gives you a ton of flexibility to customize your design. Our suggested workflow is to start by experimenting. The great part about a program like Infogram is that you can easily click through different visual types to see which one will work for you. You will often need to see the data graphed out before making further decisions on the design. Once you've made a decision on which visual makes the most sense to use, then you can figure out which design options work best. This will be a trial and error process. Then you can put any finishing touches on the final graphic. Another good way to get ideas is to simply brainstorm and sketch. When you're not limited by your knowledge of certain tools, it can be much easier to come up with innovative ideas. If you run into a question about how to do something, your first option is always to Google it. 
There are also some online communities listed here that are devoted to DataViz. If you are really having trouble or want to build something special, you can always hire a professional designer and they'll work with you to come up with a concept and build out the final design. These are some online resources in case you would like to learn more. Don't worry about writing all of them down right now. I'm going to go through it kind of quickly, but this presentation will be recorded and available later for you to access these links. And then if you find yourself struggling and in need of a creativity boost, you can always check out these options. The Information is Beautiful Awards website is a great place to find inspiration. And for those of you who are really into this field, these are some books about DataViz. So thank you for listening to our presentation today, and please let us know if you have any questions. Great. Thanks very much, Beth, Jessica. Uh, that was a lot of information, but does anybody have any uh, questions or comments? As Paulani mentioned, you can type those into the chat box on your screen there. Uh, somebody did ask if, um, if they could get a list of the, all of those tools that you just showed, Jessica. And, um, the, these pr presentations will be shared with you all after the uh, – so, so you'll be able to, to access those through the PowerPoint presentations themselves, and, and it's also being recorded. So um, all of the slides will be available to everyone if you, if you didn't get a chance to write some of this stuff down. Uh, we, do have, we do have one question. Uh, Emmanuel asks, uh, which program or platform might be used to generate a color wheel? I assume they're, they mean the color wheel similar to the one that the, uh, was used for the Kids Count project. Do either of you have any ideas about that? Jessica, did you want to answer or try to answer? My, I, I don't know um, who the specific designer was for that, but my guess is that they used something like Adobe Illustrator. Yeah, I know you can do it in Adobe Illustrator. I feel like Infogram has the ability to do something like that as well. Um, so I would check out Infogram, or you might need a professional designer to do something in Illustrator. Either of those options. Um, here's a question. Some of your examples did not show the y-axis going to 100%. So uh, Kim, Kim asks, how do you decide what range to use for your axis? That's a, a really good question. Um, it depends on what we're trying to show. So for a stacked bar chart where the categories sum to 100, I, we would always use 100%. Um, generally speaking, um, there's two rules of thumb that I use. One of them is um, I tend to make the top of the chart just slightly higher than the highest data point. So for example, if a data point was the highest data point in a time series was 22, I would make the, the top 25, or sort of that sort of general kind of rule of thumb. Um, but the other piece is that I also take into account whether it's going to be compared across multiple categories. And so if I was showing, you know, if I had two or three different um, bar charts, for example, showing child poverty by race over time, um, I would make sure that all of those axes were exactly the same. So if the highest child poverty rate for one group was 40 and the highest child poverty rate for another uh, group was 8, I would put all, put all of those on a, an axis with the 0 to 40. Great. Any other questions? We still have a few more minutes. Oh, um, what did you mean, Beth, when you uh, mentioned the bubbles should be should having? Uh, you mentioned bubbles should use diameter instead of area, or area instead of diameter, maybe. That's probably. That's more of a, a short it, with with bubble chart um, it, bubble sizes can be hard to compare. Um, so actually, you know, there's a there's a people tend not to like pie charts because it's hard to read the size of the slices. I tend to shy away from bubble charts because it's hard to read the size of bubbles, and different programs do not necessarily size them proportionately. 
Um, and, and really, it's a bigger issue when you're doing something like that, um, the person icon example that I had, where not only is there a question about whether or not they're size pro proportional, it's really clear that they're not, that one is wider than the other, even though they're showing links. Um, so I hope that that, I hope that clear. I guess I just have a general question. Um, you know, people who obviously there are some free tools available that allow people to create simple data visualizations, but um, you know, in terms of producing something like that kids account data wheel, uh, how much of an investment, either in terms of time or money, would you say would be involved, Jessica, in in producing something like that, to hire somebody to produce a very nice looking, fairly complicated and um, unique type of product like that? That's a very good question. Um, it would honestly depend on like how many different categories there are and how much you're dividing up like the circle. I guess it would probably You'd, it, there'd have to be a lot of collaboration between the data experts and the data visualization designer. And I would say maybe in terms of dollars, maybe a couple thousand dollars to design out something like that for the kids count yeah. data wheel. And then there's yeah. the time, as we know, the back and forth involved between the designer and the uh, data people, which is often multiple iterations. So there's your time as the data uh, provider and the person who's going to be putting this in your product, you have to account for that as well. Yeah. Anybody have any other final questions or comments? Okay, well, I think that we're uh, going to wrap up then. I, I do want to uh, let people know, uh, I believe Flo sent out a message about the next webinar, which is scheduled for Wednesday, December 13th at 2 o'clock. Uh, this is going to be a webinar focused on data management, so we're going to talk about kind of best practices and some tools, software that are available to help you manage your data. So we hope you all be able to join us for that. And then early next year, we're planning another webinar focused on the new racial ethnic categories that are um, planned for the 2020 census. We haven't scheduled that one yet because we're still waiting to hear OMB's official decision about whether they're actually going to combine the race ethnicity question on the 2020 census questionnaire, but we, we hope to hear soon about that decision. So thanks again for everyone uh, for participating, to our presenters, and to the Casey Foundation. Um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. This concludes today's webinar. Thanks. <laughs>